Climbing is one of the most important features in Zelda Breath of the Wild, and I spent about 40 hours trying to remake it in the Unreal Engine 5. In this video, I'm going to explain how I did it. I will simplify complex programs into digestible and understandable terms. Whether you've never made a video game before, or are an experienced programmer, I aim to teach you something new and give you a look behind the curtains of one of the best games ever made. I will first give you a brief overview of this climbing system. You can enter and exit climbing mode by pressing C. You will get this widget pop up on the screen to indicate when that's possible, which is when you're facing a wall or when you're standing on a ledge next to a climbable wall. You can climb in all directions and turn corners, both inside and outside turning ones, on any angle. If you reach the top of the wall, you will climb up on top of it. You can dash one on the wall, however, if you are too close to an edge and try to dash, your dash won't trigger to prevent the player falling off the wall. The player will try and readjust their position and angle to the surface of the wall they are climbing, and if you try and climb a wall that is at too sharp of an overhead angle, so for example a ceiling, you will be ejected from climbing mode. As you can see, this system doesn't have many animations, as I'm not an animator, just a programmer, and it won't cope well with very complex shapes, although most games wouldn't include such cases anyways. You can find all the project files on my Patreon and use it however you want. You can implement it in your own games, or just try and understand it to learn from it. The link to that is in the description. Entering and exiting climbing mode. The goal for this section is to be able to walk up to any object, check if it's climbable or not, then be able to enter and exit climbing mode. One of the reasons climbing works so well in Breath of the Wild is that you can climb anything. You see that tree over there? You can climb it. That mountain in the distance? Yep, you can climb it. Even these stables are climbable, and I love it. It's so great that you have so much freedom. But how can you turn any object into something that you can climb? Let me explain. In the Unreal Engine 5, we have access to Event Tick. This is an event that fires every tick or frame of gameplay. For us, that's great because it means every tick of gameplay, which can be over 30 times per second, we can perform a set of checks on the environment. On Event Tick, we will run a series of traces to check for certain things around the player. A trace is essentially a zone that we can create where we can get all the information about the things inside the trace. For example, a line trace, which you might have heard of about being used in FPS games, will draw a line from one point to another. You choose these points here. And if it collides with something whilst travelling from the beginning to the end, it will return you this list of information about what you hit. So how I apply this to my system is on event tick I run a capsule trace around my player. This gives me this constant shape around the player, and if anything is in this capsule, I will be returned that information. This is how we can constantly check if there's a wall in front of our player. If there is, we can run various other traces to see things like, is the wall at the player's eye level? Is it wide enough? Etc. As soon as we detect that we are near a wall that is wide enough and at our eye level, we can set a can climb variable to true. Let me demonstrate with this print string. When we walk near a wall, we get true. When we walk away, we get false. If the wall is too thin, we can check this by performing two line traces roughly at shoulder width apart. It will now say false. Then, every time we press the C button, C for climb, we can check if this variable is true or false. But what do we do when it's true? That's a great question, because there is no climb mode. I had to create my own custom settings for this. I turned the character's mode to flying, which completely changes how they handle physics by basically just making them fly instead of walk. If you don't set a max speed for flying mode, your character will do this. You also want to change this setting. Set orient character to movement to false, because otherwise, when we move sideways, our character will try and turn to face their direction, and we want them to keep facing the wall. I extended the pre-made walking functionality to check if we are in climb mode. If we are, we will apply the movement in the up, down and left, right direction, completely ignoring forward movement so we don't climb into the wall. I should point out that if you aren't in climbing mode, trying to apply a force upwards just won't work. Nothing will happen. Climbing like in the original game, when we are climbing we can go in all directions, apart from forwards of course. So up, down, left, right, and all of the diagonals in between. I got these animations for free from Mixamo, although I did try and make my own animations, I just wasn't too happy with the end result. When we press WASD, an event fires in our player character. We can simply say, add movement input. 
it's almost the exact same as the default setup in the third person template, except we need to do a little bit of maths to convert our input from forwards and backwards to up and down. It isn't much more complicated than that, to be honest. I know it sounds too simple to be true, but the pre-made functions do it all for us already. Because it's such a common game feature, engines will typically give you functions to help you set it up quicker. However, I will touch on one key point. How do we play an animation in this diagonal direction when we only have up, down, left, right climb animations? To do this, I used a blend space. A blend space will blend between two or more animations. A very common example is blending between idle and running based on speed. This blend space means that when we are at zero speed, we will play this animation. When we are at 500, we will play this running animation. And if we are at any number in between, we will see a mix or blend of the two animations. It's the same principle here for our climbing. We blend between the animations on the player based on the direction the player is climbing. If we are going left, we play the left animation. If we are going up, we play the up animation. And if we are going diagonally up to the left, we mix the two animations together to get this. This is the function I use to calculate the direction. We run it constantly in the animation blueprint to save it into a variable for constant use. Turning smooth surfaces and keeping the player close to the wall. When the character is climbing along a curved surface, like this cylinder, the player will keep updating their rotation to face the wall. This is very important. Not only does it look better, but it's necessary to keep us on the wall. If we don't update our rotation, we will come to a point where our traces don't work correctly on the wall anymore, and we will just end up climbing off the wall. We use even more traces to accomplish this. When we are climbing, we are constantly doing a line trace into the wall that we are on to find out the wall normal. The normal of a surface is a line that is perpendicular to the surface. It's facing 90 degrees out from the rest of the wall. Essentially, the wall normal tells us the outward facing direction of the wall. And if we know which way the wall is facing, we can take the X axis out of that. The X axis is the forward going direction in this 3D situation. It's not the same as a 2D graph. We need to multiply the wall normal's X vector by minus one to get the vector facing inwards to the wall. Then we can rotate to that. This branch here is just to make sure that the surface we are trying to rotate to isn't too different to our current direction. I find that without this, some bugs pop up, but it doesn't change the key idea. I know that might sound confusing, so I'll remove the mathsy terms and make it simple. We find the outwards going direction of the wall and inverse it to find the rotation our player needs to be facing into the wall when they are climbing. To keep the character closer to the wall, we get the impact point of the line trace into the wall. So just a reference to the part of the wall in front of us. And we move our character to 40 times the wall normal. As previously mentioned, the wall normal is the outward going direction. So 40 times the wall normal is a point that is a little bit out of the wall. I did another check with a dot product to make sure that the angle of the wall we are trying to move to isn't too steep compared to the player because I found that can also lead to complications. Getting to the top of a wall. When we reach the top of a wall, or very close to it, we will move our character onto the top of the wall and exit climbing mode. We can achieve this by, once again, performing a sphere trace above the character's head into the wall. As soon as this trace no longer detects anything, we know that we've got to the top of the wall. You only run this check when you are already in climb mode, because when you are just walking around, you don't have anything above your head, and you don't want to run this event in that case. When we find that there is no longer a wall in front of us, we can get the end point of the line trace that we just ran and add some of the actor's downward vector to it. So make it go into the floor of the wall we are climbing. And you might be thinking we can move to it now. And we can, but we need one final check. We need to check that the player fits into the space above the wall. In situations like this, they obviously can. But what if the wall's like this? We obviously don't want to move up here or we'll move into the wall. What we can do is run a capsule trace that is the size of the player on top of the wall. And if it doesn't collide with anything, then we know that there is space on top of the wall and the player can move to it. Entering climb mode from the top of a surface. Now, if we can climb up a wall, we also need to be able to climb down. That's why I did this feature. If you're on top of a wall, next to the edge specifically, and there is enough space for the player to climb down, you will get this pop up again, allowing the player to enter climb mode. You might be able to figure out now how I did this. Yep, more traces. We can do a trace to the floor in front of the character to check if the space just in front of them is on the ground or not. If it's not, we can do another trace to find the position of the wall just below us. 
When we have a position on the side of the wall, we need to check with the capsule trace if there's room for our player. Just like with this step up mechanic. If there is, great, we move our character to the side of the wall and set their rotation. If not, then do nothing. I know I'm going a bit faster now, but it's really just the same thing as before. It's just different places that we're checking with sphere traces. Once I had cracked this for the corners, this all became a whole lot easier. Dashing. When on the wall, for a small cost to the player's stamina, you can press the spacebar to dash in the direction you are moving, unless you are near an edge, in which case the dash doesn't fire, as I didn't want the player to just fire off the side of the wall. This is one of the easier mechanics to implement. We want to get the velocity of the player, so the direction that they're moving in, and do a sphere trace a little bit in front of them in that direction. We also had a little bit of the actor's forward vector to make it go into the wall so we can check if there is indeed a wall or not where we're intending to dash to. If there is a wall, we can move to it. If there isn't, we do nothing. You will notice that this dash looks a bit smoother despite the lack of animation still. This is because I used a timeline. A timeline is a really useful tool when you want something to happen gradually and not instantly. We can create this timeline, which is just a graph, and plot time on the bottom with a value on the side. We need two points. One at 0, 0 and one at 0 0.25 seconds, with one value on the y-axis. We can turn this line into a float value which increases from 0 to 1 linearly over 0 0.25 seconds. This float value is then used to lerp between the pre-dash and post-dash vector, so the point where you were before you started the dash and where you are trying to dash to. A lerp vector will slowly move between the two vectors, a bit like the animation blend space we discussed earlier. At 0 0.12 seconds on the timeline, for example, halfway in, the return vector will be halfway between the two. Then every time this updates slightly, we set the actor's location. This gives a nice smooth effect rather than a quick snap to the location. Stamina. I saved the easiest mechanic to last. This was very simple. There are loads of tutorials on how to do something like this. Whenever you climb, you lose a little stamina and you lose 20% of your max stamina if you dash. When you're out of stamina, you will just fall off the wall. This is just a matter of creating a current stamina and max stamina variable. Then, with every movement, you can decrease your stamina slightly and only move if you have enough stamina to move. I didn't want to get too much into this because it's very basic, but what I will talk more about is how did I get this stamina wheel rather than the bar? Because 90% of tutorials will typically use a percentage bar rather than a wheel because it's just easier. This is the material setup I used. I had to copy what someone else did, as I just didn't know how, to be honest. Materials are a whole other section of programming that I just haven't yet explored, although I do want to. You basically just rotate the material by an amount determined by your current stamina. I made a widget blueprint in which we can create an image, onto which we can add this stamina wheel, and then we can put the entire widget into the hood. If you want to get this stamina wheel and use it yourself, you can find all the project files on my Patreon and then you can use it in your own games. A link to that is in the description. Limitations. Finally, I will conclude with some of the limitations of the system. It's not a nice topic to talk about, and trust me, 95% of people don't because unless people will download and use the system, but it's important that you understand what this system can't do as well as what it can. Whilst it can consistently and reliably deal with these kinds of shapes, when you start trying to climb some awkward angles and mixtures of lots of different shapes with loads of surfaces for the player to consider, it's quite probable that you'll be ejected from the wall, as you stay on the wall as long as your traces are detecting the walls in front of you, but when you keep getting pulled in loads of weird directions, some of these may fail. Although, you could probably just get around this by not building such shapes into your game, in Zelda Breath of the Wild, you don't really see shapes like this, maybe a bit on the castle, but if you want your characters to climb rigid buildings or relatively smooth mountains, this will be absolutely fine. So this system is not perfect, there are some issues, and it is a relatively basic system at the end of the day. Nevertheless, it would hugely support the channel if you subscribe to my Patreon, as I don't make anything from these videos, and they take a very long time to produce and you'll get access to all the project files for full use and any project files I release in the future. I'm currently working on a building, editing and harvesting system where I remake all of the building mechanics from Fortnite. So make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that video when it comes out. Hopefully you've learned something from this video because it's exactly what I would have wanted to see before I made the system. Thanks for watching.